Hey everyone, Chloe here again. So this is just a quick disclaimer before we get into the video. Once we get into it, you'll notice that my hair is no longer purple. But don't fret, I have not changed my hair. This video was just recorded about a month or so ago, right before I did this wonderful thing. Stay tuned and I hope you enjoy. Hey again everyone, Chloe from The Chloe Connection here, and today we're going to be talking about a few more questions that you can ask yourself and your providers prior to getting SRS, particularly vaginoplasties. A big one that I didn't really consider until after I was sitting in a consultation is ask your doctor if you can see before and after pictures. Even better if they have those on some sort of website that you can access. Typically, doctors who are in their own private practice will likely have some pictures of before and after results. I've seen this more often with like facial feminization, but you know, some doctors do post results before and after, you know, for top surgery and bottom surgery. I think it's important to kind of get some semblance of an idea of kind of the work that the doctor or doctors you're considering have done. And does it look like something that you wouldn't mind having if that's how your results turned out? It's probably not the most positive spin on that. Like, does it look nice? Would you like that? You know, there wasn't really much on the internet about my surgeon, which, you know, looking back now, I think was a little bit of a red flag, but there might have been some restrictions and stipulations since they're directly were directly tied to a university system, a university healthcare system. I don't know the ins and outs of that. Be sure to ask if you can't easily access because it might be something that they can provide to you during a consultation. Consider your accommodations. If you're traveling, which you most likely are because there aren't that many providers here in the country, you know, talking about the United States, or if you're going to other countries, because some people do decide to do that. There are providers in like Canada and Spain that I am aware of that also do really good surgeries. Some of those might be for facial feminization surgery, so don't quote me on any of that. Unless you live in like a major city, you will most likely be traveling, so ask about duration, accommodations, how long is this surgery expected to take? How long is the recovery time expected? Do they want you there for, you know, post-op checkups, things like that? How long is your entire stay going to be from pre-op to post-op to checkups and all that? Really check in and see what your doctor and their team recommend in terms of where you can stay. All the better if they have places on site or nearby that are specifically for their patients to stay. I know that was the case for some people I know that went to Thailand for surgery. It was kind of like all inclusive and there was a place nearby or on site where they would stay for the recovery. It seemed much more comfortable than staying in a hospital for a week. You know, you will be on bed rest for a little while. You will be uncomfortable for a while. So your accommodations should hopefully be comfortable. I think it's something that's important not to kind of forego or skimp out on or kind of just ignore which is something I kind of did. I didn't really think about that. It was more like, oh, I got the surgery. A doctor's supposed to be good. It's covered by insurance. Cool. And it's like, oh shit, this really sucks being in this hospital for a week. And the care and accommodations kind of left a lot of things wanting. And as part of that, you know, I talked about complications in the previous video, and I can't remember if I mentioned this exact point, but talk to your doctor about who in the area where you reside may be a good option for any sort of revision surgery, depending on what happens. You know, in all likelihood, best case scenario would be going back to the person who performed the surgery, but that might not be an option. So I think it's something important to consider. You know, I left the hospital and went home still on a catheter just because of the time in the surgery right around Christmas and I didn't really want to wait. And I just had a doctor back in Florida remove the catheter. So not exactly the same thing, but, you know, talk to your team to see who can help you with any post-op care or checkups as well. And when we're talking about the recovery process, this might be an important question to ask. When 
can I return to work? Hmm. And there's different ways to approach this. When can I return to work? When should I return to work? When do I need to t return to work? Those are all very different questions, and some of that will be up to the recovery, some of that will be up to you, some of that will be recommended by the doctor. My surgeon recommended a minimum of like 10 to 14 days. Like you could go back to work after about two weeks. It likely would be unpleasant. I believe I went back to work after about three and a half weeks, four weeks maybe, four weeks. I don't know, I think it was maybe about four weeks. But I wasn't in a hurry to get back. I could have gone back much sooner, but I wanted to recover and also try my best to enjoy some time not being at work, even though I was not extremely mobile and was in pain. It was still better than being at work. So if your job is demanding, it's hard to get time off, or you know you can't be away for an extended period of time for whatever reason, this is probably going to be something important to consider, and it may affect the previous question about travel. You know, where you can travel to and how long you can stay might be impacted by your job as well. If you have access to insurance, you know, look into the whole rigmarole and making sure that it is not exclusionary of trans affirmative care and policies more often I'm seeing these days exclude some surgeries, but not all. Sex reassignment surgery tends to be more covered than other things like top surgery, top surgery for trans women, top surgery for trans men who are getting a mastectomy. That is more likely to be covered than top surgery for a trans woman in the form of breast augmentation. In terms of questions for your doctor, ask them if they take insurance. That's a big first question. You know, depending on the surgeries you're pursuing and kind of how they approach it. For sex reassignment surgery, most providers will take, or most, you know, surgeons, medical providers will take some form of insurance. When you're getting into things like facial feminization surgery, it can get a little more nebulous, let's say that. But ask them, do they take insurance? And if so, what does that process look like? What, you know, insurance providers do they accept? And ask about what they might need to get that coverage. You know, how many letters do they need? From whom do they need the letters? When do they need them by? You know, look and see if there are requirements in terms of how long you've been on hormones. And those are things you'd probably discuss with your primary care or your endocrinologist to include in those letters, kind of making sure you're covering all those bases in the letters that you're providing. And then, you know, kind of a second part, a part B of this question is ask them, when do they file their claim for insurance? There's likely gonna be a long wait list for these surgeries. You know, you're looking at probably anywhere from 12 to 36 months, depending on the provider. But, you know, ask them about how does that insurance claim filing, whatever the terminology is, how does that work? Because um, they're if you're 12, 24 months away, they're not going to file that paperwork right away, most likely, because your insurance plan could very well be different by the time your surgery rolls around. My, my surgeon's office filed, I think, a month or so before. I don't know if that's standard protocol, but I imagine closer to the surgery is probably more common than further from the surgery. So I think that's a good thing to ask about to get maybe a little bit peace of mind of kind of the process. Because for me, it was a little nerve wracking to be like, okay, the surgery is, I think maybe 10 months off from the consultation. And I'm not gonna know for sure if this is gonna be covered by my insurance for nine months. So it's a little nerve wracking, you know, scheduling this far in advance and waiting all that time and then not knowing for sure about the insurance. So asking can maybe help relieve some of that anxiety just to get some clarity on what that might look like. So I'm going to stop there. I still have a, a few other things that I think are important to ask, and I think I'll put that out in a third video later on. So just as kind of a recap, you know, some of the things I think are important to ask in terms of this video. Ask about before and after pictures. See those results. Ask about traveling and accommodations, and in part of that, Ask about where you can go locally if you're traveling for surgery. 
in terms of post-op care and any complications. You know, refer back to my previous video if you want a little more detail on asking about complications and what to do in that case. When can you return to work? That might be an important thing to ask depending on your current situation. Insurance coverage. You know, how does that process go? How does the claim filing go? What do you need to get covered? Which will involve conversations with both your surgeons, their doctor of the doctor office, and with your insurance company, most likely. Let me know down in the comments what you think about these things to ask potential providers. Great things to ask during or even before a consultation. Let me know your thoughts on these questions. Let me know if there's other things you think are important to ask or consider. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I love you all. Bye for now.